really great to see so many people joining us today. Um, welcome from across industry and the investor community. We're really excited to be able to present this event and showcase just some of the transformative research that's being done at the University of Michigan. Um, with over $1.6 billion in annual research expenditures, U of M is the nation's leading public research university. And the mission of our group, Innovation Partnerships, is to amplify the impact of this research so that every U of M discovery has the best chance to positively impact the world. Um, we do this by supporting University of Michigan faculty in their efforts to commercialize their research discoveries and technologies. The world needs transformative research more now than ever before. And I hope that today's program is going to inspire and excite you to connect and engage with our team and with the incredible researchers at the Rogel Cancer Center. It's now my honor to introduce Rich Rogel, chair of the Rogel Cancer Center's National Advisory Board to share a few opening comments. Rich? Kelly, I'm excited to kick off this event what I hope will become the first of many updates from Ann Arbor. When my wife Susan and I decided to support the Cancer Center at the University of Michigan, we already knew U of M was a special place where collaboration and teamwork led to breakthrough discoveries. We challenged the university to bring together the leaders and best in cancer research to understand the origins and behaviors of cancer and to translate that knowledge to help prevent cancer, improve outcomes for those diagnosed with cancer, and improve quality of life for cancer survivors. This is about changing people's lives for the better. The two technologies highlighted today are among some of the exciting discoveries being pioneered by this team. I'm inspired by the progress they've made and excited for you to hear more about their work. With that, I'll pass the mic to Eric Firon, director of the Rogel Cancer Center, to tell us a bit more about his team's work before we hear about today's highlighted technologies. Eric? Yeah, we're uh, honored to be here today uh, to share just a little bit of uh, the science and, and innovation at the Rogel Cancer Center, which I think is emblematic of of lots of activities across the, the many schools and colleges at the University of Michigan. So I'm gonna share some slides with you today so you can get a sense of the Rogel Cancer Center's breadth and, and depth uh, before we turn to uh, some really exciting work from two of our amazing colleagues, Dr. James Moon and Dr. Nori Niamati. So the Rogel Cancer Center uh, has the privilege of being one of 71 uh, cancer centers in the U.S. that are designated by the National Cancer Institute, and we're one of 51 centers designated as a comprehensive cancer center, which we've been designated as that since 1991, and that reflects the range and breadth of our activities across the full cancer field, as well as our activities in training the next generation of cancer providers and cancer research pioneers and, and service to communities around the state and around the country and around the globe. The mission of the Rogel Cancer Center is to reduce the burden of cancer and advance health equity through transdisciplinary collaboration and research, education, patient care, as well as community outreach. And our vision is to be a leader in prevention, early diagnosis, optimal treatment, and care for all of those at risk of or affected by cancer. Our members at the University of Michigan come from nine schools and 44 primary departments, and they collectively hold appointments in um, nearly 55 departments counting their secondary appointments. So very robust and deep engagement of the broad uh, collection of, of schools at the University of Michigan. The schools and colleges that we engage are in the center panel and they range from dentistry to social work. And you'll hear today from two colleagues of mine in the College of Pharmacy as their primary appointments. We also uh, engage a number of institutes and centers that cut across the fabric of the institution, uh, multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary in nature. And I won't review all of these, but they're, they're powerful engines of discovery, uh, each in their own way. The Cancer Center members, 83% of them have active grants. The, the members who don't have active grants tend to be very new faculty or faculty who are deeply engaged in clinical research. And our annual cancer funding in terms of annual direct cost expenditures 
is nearly $120 million. The uh, lion's share of that is from the National Cancer Institute. And then we have a significant funding from the NIH as well as other peer reviewed organization. And our cancer center funding from the NCI has grown about 40% over the past four to five years. Among the many metrics that we keep track of are the number of papers that we publish annually, uh, the collaborations of those uh, between programs and within research programs, as well as the impact factor. But we keep track of many other metrics, including uh, patents and, and uh, technologies that are licensed. We're very active in clinical research, and this just highlights some of the metrics around uh, how long it takes to activate trials, which we're working very hard to get well under 100 days and, and making strong progress in the recent uh, quarters that, in that area. We're deeply engaged in, in treatment research as well as uh, interventional trials that focus on, on a cancer symptom management or improving outcomes for cancer patients and survivors. And at any one point now, we have uh, a little in excess of 200 open clinical trials that are accruing. We have a, a very distinguished collection of members and, and some of the many highlights of the members are, are highlighted here. Uh, they include a, a election to the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences, and some major prizes that are highlighted in the center. And I call attention to Dr. Rul Chanayan, who's an extremely eminent uh, cancer geneticist who just received the, the Schoberg Prize, uh, just announced and will be uh, going to Stockholm to receive that prize later this month. Our senior leadership council is really critical to our activities and, and the, that group of, of colleagues is highlighted here. Uh, Deputy Director, Dr. Pavan Reddy and the various associate directors each working in particular areas, uh, including research across the continuum, a career development and training, community outreach and engagement, a broad collection of efforts in diversity, equity, inclusion and justice, as well as Julie Brabs, who's, who's vital to essentially coordinating all of our activities as in her role of AD for administration. We have six research programs cutting across the landscape of cancer from very basic work on the origins of cancer and behaviors of cancer, all the way to health policy and implementation over on the far right of the slide. And, and each of the programs has very robust funding and very robust publication and, and collaboration metrics and the impact of their work. And so it's a, an extremely talented team of, of scientists. Our strategic research priorities for the next five-year period are highlighted here. Cancer initiation, progression, and resistance, cancer treatment and care delivery paradigms, and cancer risk reduction. And in, in line with all of these uh, priorities, we're, we're always considering how do we impact on, on citizens in the state of Michigan and beyond. So studying cancers that are particularly uh, high incidence associated with poor outcomes and disparities, and, and advancing cancer health equity is one of our top priorities. The research themes that really unite members, the 300 plus members in our cancer center are highlighted in the lower portion of this slide. And you can see they go from the, the Northwest quadrant uh, of the, the panel from tumor metabolism and, and microenvironment work, uh, quite basic work on, on in laboratory-based studies for the most part, all the way to issues in health policy, healthcare implementation and, and defining what's high value care and, and most cost effective care treatments. Just wanna highlight some papers from just the past year that we're extremely proud of. One of the areas that, that were particularly noteworthy and you'll hear some of our efforts today uh, fr from Drs. Moon and Niamati is really in cancer targets and treatment research. And these are just some papers from the, the past year that, that highlight some of that really exciting work. Uh, cancer metabolism and tumor microenvironments, another extremely busy area in our cancer center. And I think we're leaders uh, nationally in that area and internationally in a number of, of cancer types and a number of cancer uh, TME factors. Cancer immunity and immunotherapy, also some terrific papers from uh, Wei Ping Zhu and James Moon and, and others here highlighted on this slide. And pediatric brain tumor research, again, a, a relatively uncommon common but extremely uh, unfortunate cancer for families and, and children affected by this. And we're making some significant strides in this space. Uh, also work moving to the clinic from, from discovery work in our own laboratories. Bone marrow transplantation, similarly, all the way from the laboratory to the clinic and, and national studies arising from the work that we're doing here at the University of Michigan and understanding how to manage acute graft versus host disease in, in much more robust ways. So the showcase presentations today, we're really proud of the work from all of our colleagues, but I think it's gonna be a special opportunity to hear from James Moon around novel strategies for cancer immunotherapy, 
as well as from Dr. Noreen Niamati on targeting the vulnerabilities of cancer metabolism. And I'll turn it back over uh, to Kate Remus to introduce Dr. Moon. Thank you very much. Um, I'm honored to be here. Uh, thank you again for your invitation to share our work on uh, new ways to improve uh, the potency and efficacy as well as safety of immune checkpoint blockers. So I'm James Simoon, Professor of uh, Pharmaceutical Sciences and Biomedical Engineering, and my lab is developing uh, new drug delivery platforms uh, to improve uh, cancer immunotherapy. So today I'll talk about uh, three ongoing major projects in the lab, um, and that's highlighted here. Our work is uh, quite translational. Um, so in one of the first projects I'll describe, it's uh, a nanodisc platform for subcutaneous delivery of uh, immunotherapeutic agents targeting to lymphoid tissues. It's been licensed to evoke therapeutics where I serve as a, a CSO. And also in second project, uh, we'll talk about uh, innate immune activator based on sting agonist for systemic cancer immunotherapy uh, that led to a recent startup company called the Saros Therapeutics. And third, uh, we'll talk about uh, novel approaches to modulate the gut microbiome using uh, engineered um, dietary fibers. And um, uh, there's a, a um, and then there's a, my relevant disclosure slide as well. So today uh, we'll focus on cancer immunotherapy in my talk. Uh, as you know, immune checkpoint blockers uh, are revolutionizing how we are treating cancer patients. We now have a subset of uh, patients that are considered cured, but as you can uh, see from this uh, y-axis, only subset of patients are uh, responding to immune checkpoint blockers. Uh, so my lab, as well as others in the field, are uh, trying to improve uh, patient response rates by uh, designing a different combination approaches. So what are the major goals? Um, as I mentioned, only uh, 5 to 30 percent of patients are responding to current immune checkpoint blockers. And these uh, immune checkpoint blockers augment the pre-existing immune responses. Uh, but there's a, a lack of tumor infiltration into uh, uh, infiltration of T cells. Uh, so we need a new approaches to turn uh, cold uh, tumors without T cells into a uh, hot tumor that's infiltrated with a lot of uh, uh, um, anti-tumor myeloid cells and T cells without generating uh, adverse events. So let's, with that background, let's go to the first technology. It's a, a nano disc for lymph node targeted uh, vaccine delivery. Uh, our platform is based on high density lipoprotein. Uh, uh, similar to our endogenous HDL, uh, we designed um, and engineered a synthetic version of it using phospholipids and 20 tumor APOA mimetic peptide. So by simply mixing this 20 tumor peptide with the lipids, we can make a 10 nanometer sized, very tiny uh, nano disc. And onto this, we attach um, Auto antigen as well as cancer antigens uh, for vaccination. Uh, what's interesting about them is after sub-Q injection, they have a very strong lymphatic delivery. So this is in mice and non-human primates. Uh, amount of antigen that's delivered to lymph nodes after sub-Q injection using nano disc uh, versus injection of free naked peptide. So whereas a free naked peptide enters blood circulation right away. Nanodisc has a preferential uptake into the lymph system, delivering a huge amount of drug to immune cells residing in lymphoid tissues. And one of the first studies we did was uh, actually on immune tolerance. Uh, we are trying to use autoimmune antigens uh, to basically reverse uh, inflammation. So this is a widely used mouse model of multiple sclerosis called EAE. Uh, you uh, sensitize mice using uh, a nerve uh, protein called MAG, and mice become paralyzed within two weeks. And at that point, at the peak of the disease, we give a nanodisc sub-Q, uh, and the nanodisc carries the uh, CD4 antigen. And this results in strong induction of regulatory T cells in antigen-specific manner, uh, reversing the disease uh, quite effectively. We have also done a similar study in type 1 diabetes, another 
autoimmune disease, uh, uh, antigen-driven autoimmune disease. Basically, we use the same platform, NanoDisc, to deliver the type 1 diabetes antigen, and we can prevent uh, type 1 diabetes induction in 100% of cases in this uh, widely used uh, mouse model of um, diabetes. Uh, so this led to um, a collaboration with Amgen, and we are pursuing a select autoimmune disease indications uh, with Amgen. And also we are developing our internal programs to go after uh, many other uh, autoimmune diseases. But what's interesting about this platform is the same platform can be used to deliver cancer uh, vaccines and other immunotherapeutic agents to lymph nodes. So we use the same synthetic HDL platform and onto this we attach uh, either tumor associated antigen peptides or uh, patient specific new antigens onto that and co-load with adjuvant. And adjuvant is crucial because in immune tolerance, you're trying to get regulatory T cells, but with um, cancer vaccines, you are trying the reverse. Uh, so here we can put DNA-based and adjuvant or RNA-based adjuvant systems for co-loading into the system. And after sub-Q injection, we see very robust delivery to dendritic cells and induction of strong immune responses. Uh, we have done a number of studies in different mouse models. So sh I'll show you just a quick summary. Uh, this is the uh, in MC38 colon carcinoma model, syngenic tumor model, where we put the new antigen peptides onto the nano disc. And after three rounds of vaccination, up to 30% of all CD8 T cells in mice are single antigen specific. And that is about 30 times better than what you can get with the other leading adjuvants in clinical trials. So what does that mean? Once you get such strong anti-tumor T cell response, you can now combine with immune checkpoint blockers and unleash their full cytotoxic potential. Uh, so this is the B16F10 model, syngenic melanoma model, where we wait until they tend to establish tumors. And after three rounds of the nanodisc vaccine plus immune checkpoint blocker, uh, we see nice uh, tumor regression in majority of animals. Uh, and that's much better than traditional peptide vaccine uh, without the nanodisc formulation. We have done these studies in other murine models, um, including uh, colon as well as breast cancer. Uh, one of the most challenging uh, tumor is a uh, glioblastoma. Uh, so we've done some studies with uh, a good collaborator of ours, Maria Castro, to uh, tested this autotopic glioma model. And even in this condition, we see a uh, very nice T cell infiltration into tumors. Uh, and we saw 30% tumor eradication rate. So if you're interested in um, a cancer vaccine or ways to deliver drugs to lymphoid tissues, I think NanoDisc will be a, a good platform uh, for doing that. Uh, switching gears to the second technology, um, we recently developed a novel way to induce a type 1 interferon response in tumor tissues. And, and we uh, and developed a systemic platform for cancer immunotherapy using this system. <clears throat> C-gasting pathway has garnered a lot of attention in cancer immunotherapy. Um, Basically, when immune cells recognize exogenous DNA present in cytosol, uh, this triggers very potent type 1 interferon response. And this is mediated by enzyme, cytosolic enzyme um, CGAS that recognizes cytosolic DNA that triggers a uh, uh, reaction between ATP, GTP to form this uh, cyclic dinucleotides. And this cyclic dinucleotide is a potent signaling molecule for sting receptor. And once sting is activated, uh, it leads to NF kappa B activation and strong type 1 interferon response. And this has a very potent antiviral and anti tumor um, uh, immune responses. So, based on uh, this pathway, a number of pharma companies and uh, biotech companies are developing. Uh, the synthetic version of these uh, dicyclic uh, nucleotides. Uh, companies such as Ajuro, Novartis, BMS, Merck, um, GSK, they all have their own uh, pipeline for developing these. And there are over 12 different phase one clinical trials ongoing in uh, many different uh, cancer types. 
But what I see as a major limitation of these conventional sting agonists is that um, almost all of them ha ha have to be injected directly into tumor. Um, and as you know, uh, systemic injection is necessary to address uh, you know, disseminated cancer and advanced cancer. So this has major limitations. So wh why can't you inject these um, systemically? Uh, that's because these small molecules are rapidly cleared. Um, and also it's a highly anionic molecule that has a very low uptake by immune cells. And immune cells are the key ones that are, uh, that need to phagocytose these and uh, secret type one interferon response. So these are two major limitations. And also, uh, there are variations in human haplotypes uh, for sting haplotypes. So not all sting agonists work across all human population. So you need a way to uh, come up with a universal platform. <clears throat> so uh, in our work, we are addressing these major uh, issues by uh, developing uh, a new uh, way to deliver sting agonist. Uh, in our work, uh, that was recently published, what we reported was that when you mix sting agonist, cyclidinucleotides with a little bit of manganese, uh, you see very potent synergy. We see up to 70 fold better induction of uh, type 1 interferon secretion. And this is, uh, seems to be a universal pathway because it works in, uh, in all the human haplo sting haplotypes we have tried in vitro. So, in terms of manganese, it's a nutritional metal ion that we all consume from uh, eating vegetables, and it's crucial for immune regulation. And there are some FDA-approved uh, imaging agents that has uh, manganese. Um, so there is a presence of using manganese in pharmaceutical products. So in this work, what we did was we co-formulated uh, cyclic dinucleotides with the manganese into a stable liposomal formulation. And now we can do not only intratumoral injection, but also intravenous injection, and thereby turning cold tumor into hot tumor infiltrated by immune cells. So in tumor, syngenic tumor bearing mice uh, that has a colon carcinoma CT26, uh, we inject these uh, CMP, cyclodinucleotide manganese particles IV, and see where they are uh, distributing. And this is what happens to their uh, immune cells within tumor tissues. Uh, we see very strong uptake of our particles by immune cells, such as dendritic cells, macrophages, and MDSCs. And this is a, a very important distinction from free sting agonist. Uh, first of all, you don't have much uptake in the tumor tissues at all. But even if you get small amount, uh, you see um, the immune cells are not taking up these uh, traditional sting agonists. So why is that? Because I think our particles are selectively targeting immune cells and, and these uh, antigen presenting cells are pretty phagocytic. Uh, so we see such a strong uh, immune activation among um, immune infiltrate, tumor infiltrating immune cells. And this is the amount of a, a type of interferon that immune cells secrete uh, when they are incubated with our particles as opposed to uh, unformulated uh, sting agonist with or without manganese. So we see a much better uptake in vivo as well as a very strong uh, sting activation and type of interferon secretion. So that translates to a much better anti-tumor efficacy. So we use the syngenic B16 F10 melanoma model. We wait until day nine when tumors are about 50 millimeter cubed. And then we do three IV injections of our uh, CMP particles. And this outcompetes all the other comparison groups we had in this trial. So other comparison groups included the GSK's uh, DI-ABZI, that's in phase one clinical trials. We also included the Ajiro compound. This is a first in class sting agonist that uh, went into phase two trials. Unfortunately, they failed to show efficacy for the number of reasons I mentioned but we are significantly outcompeting that. We also had a, another interesting comparison group. We switched manganese from our particles to zinc, and, and this was even better than the GSK compound. Uh, we are looking into mechanism of action, but we think manganese is crucial to see good delivery as well as synergy with the, the sting agonist. 
We also had a uh, free liposomes uh, that has a uh, sting agonist alone without metal, and that was not that efficacious. Uh, we have done these studies in a number of uh, immune tumor models, but what's really exciting is it's working very well in uh, genetically engineered mouse model as well. So this is a triple negative breast cancer model, MMTB PYMT. Uh, this, uh, they form tumors starting 40 days of age throughout their memory fat pads. And they are very poorly vascularized, therefore very hard to treat using traditional chemo and immunotherapies, as well as uh, drug-loaded nanoparticles, because you don't see much drug accumulation in tumor. But in this very challenging model, uh, six cycles of our particle given starting day 75 uh, can significantly uh, reduce the tumor mass, uh, as opposed to free sting agonist treated mice that develop huge tumors throughout the body. So this shows you the potency of our particle system. Uh, we believe um, the particles are going into tumor, but also into spleen to elicit anti-tumor uh, immune responses in, in a systemic manner, uh, thereby turning cold tumor into hot. And we have uh, um, ongoing studies to uh, test this in rabbit tumor models, as well as in dog cancer patients. I think it'll be it'll generate some very nice proof of concept preclinical data showing um, that that we can translate to large animals and hopefully to cancer patients in the near future. Okay, for the last part, I want to switch gears completely and talk about gut microbiome. Uh, this is a very exciting project for us. We are developing a novel oral dietary fiber for modulating gut microbiome. And this is a quite different from traditional sense of a pharmaceutical development. As you know, gut microbiome has garnered a lot of attention these days and healthy micro, uh, microbiome is crucial for maintaining uh, in a normal healthy status in, in our body. Um, and in series of papers published in 2018, they have shown that gut microbiome is also crucial to patients' response rates to immune checkpoint blockers because if you uh, give oral antibiotics in cancer patients before immune checkpoint blocker therapy, they don't respond very well. And this was also shown in uh, mouse models by basically giving oral antibiotics before immune checkpoint blocker therapy, they deplete gut microbiome and, and, and lose efficacy to immune checkpoint. And, and, and if you supplement that with a specific microbes such as Akkamensia and other, others, that can trigger local um, anti-tumor immune responses, then you can restore responsiveness to uh, immune checkpoint blockers. So based on this and others, um, there are biotech companies that are trying to develop collection of probiotics to give to cancer patients, or they even, um, some companies are giving fecal microbiota from donor to recipient to restore healthy microbiome. We are taking a completely different approach uh, very safe and effective in our hands. Uh, we designed a dietary fiber that serves as a food source for the gut residing microbes. And by, by giving oral enolin gel in tumor bearing mice, what we have shown in this recent work is that it coats the colon uh, with enolin gel. And colon is important because all these beneficial microbes are actually residing in colon, not in small intestine or other areas. So having this colon retentive enolin gel allows us to give uh, nutrients to the microbes there, and they produce uh, metabolites that turn T cells into very strong anti-tumor T cells. So I'll walk you through, quickly walk you through this. Uh, we, we screened FDAs generally regarded as a safe materials. These are um, ingredients found in our food as well as dietary supplements. They include the inulin, fucoidin, EGCG from green tea and melatonin. These all have been shown to modulate the gut microbiome in different indications. So what we did was we uh, screened this in our tumor model. So in, in syngenic CT26 tumor, where we implant tumors at sub-Q flank away from GI tract, we wait until tumors are formed and then give oral gavage of different uh, grass materials. And we supplement that by IP injection of an immune checkpoint blocker anti-PD-1. So what we are looking at is a systemic immune responses against the distant tumor, distant from GI tract. 
So this is the tumor growth curve for the non-treated mice with in, immune checkpoint anti-PD-1, we see some response, but uh, the inulin stands out. Uh, it has a strong synergy with immune checkpoint blockers. So what is inulin? Inulin is a polysaccharide found in uh, chicory root and Jerusalem artichoke. It has a sweet flavor. So uh, food industry is adding inulin to different beverages, cookies, and butter uh, as a zero uh, calorie sugar substitute. What we uh, found was that if you make it into a gel and give it orally, it coats the colon much better, giving a strong synergy with the immune checkpoint. So as I mentioned, the native, inul uh, native inulin uh, is actually uh, 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 cleared from colon tissue pretty rapidly. Uh, so what we are doing is making into a colon retentive viscous gel. So we screened the many different inulin from uh, different vendors and found the specific molecular weight and density that allows us to do this. And by adding just simple water and going through heating and cool cycle, we can make it into a gel as shown here. So by using fluorophore tagged inulin, what we show is that inulin gel uh, given orally is retained much longer in colon tissue compared with a native unmodified inulin given orally that's rapidly cleared from colon. And once colon is the target, what we have shown is that it basically changes the gut microbiome and their metabolite status. Um, and this results in much better synergy with the immune checkpoint blockers. So in the same uh, CT26 model, if you give anti-PD-1 alone uh, versus native inulin, you see some uh, synergy. But now with inulin gel combo, uh, you see even better rate of tumor eradication with 70% of mice are eradicating tumors. And these survivors uh, are resistant to tumor rechallenge, showing they are uh, establishing long-term immune responses against uh, tumor relapse. Uh, so that was done in white mice biopsy, and we have done this in um, black mice, CT26, uh, MC38 colon carcinoma model, just to validate the technology. We have also done this in B16 F10 melanoma. And quite excitingly, we also have done this in a genetically engineered mouse model of a colon carcinoma. In APC mean transgenic mice, if we add a 2% DSS in drinking water, it accelerates uh, colon adenocarcinoma formation in, in, uh, as shown here. And it, even in that autotopic tumor model, if you give inulin gel plus anti-PD-1, we see significant reduction in tumor numbers as well as tumor area. And we have also done this in a, a dual immune checkpoint blocker combination, in particular anti-PD-1 and CTLA-4. In that setting, adding inulin gel even further leads to uh, anti-tumor efficacy. What's notable is that these dual immune checkpoint blockers in the clinic causes high rate of uh, adverse events as shown by colitis and, uh, and IBD. Up to 30% of patients experience these side effects. But what's interesting is inulin has a beneficial effect against the colitis and IBD. So in this mouse model, we have basically shown that when you supplement inulin gel, when mice are giving immune checkpoint blocker, you can significantly alleviate immune checkpoint blocker induced colitis. So it's showing we increase the potency and safety of immune checkpoint blockers. So overall, we have shown that uh, inulin gel given orally uh, can provide the food source for the gut microbes and they in turn produce metabolites to turn T cells into anti-tumor T cells. So you may ask, uh, if you give metabolites as a pill, would that work? And actually, no. If you add a short-chain fatty acids or the metabolites in drinking water, it gets rapidly observed and cleared. So it does not lead to any synergy with the immune checkpoint. So you needed this slow release formulation in colon to drive this response. I think it's a quite exciting area. A lot of patients are already on immune checkpoint. What we are doing is making now a kilogram scale of this dietary fiber gel. Only thing we are doing is adding water and doing heating and cooling cycle. So we are now preparing 10 gram a daily package as like a yogurt, yogurt so we can test it in healthy volunteers and cancer patients in the near future. So with that, I wanna thank you for your attention and all the lab members who have done the work. Thank you.
and, and this is a contact information if you uh, have any questions about these technologies.